Okay. <laughs> Oh, what did I do? Not what I was supposed to do. There we go. All right, let's see how we're doing. Up to two. You might have to redraw it and draw on the hydrogen, stuff like that. All right, ready? Wow, that about covers it. Okay, I'm going to take the pen and I'm gonna draw in all the hydrogens. So let's make sure that we agree where the hydrogens are, right? All right, so I use, I use red and I'm gonna get skinnier. Okay, so this carbon has three hydrogens, right? This carbon has three hydrogens, right? What about this carbon? This one. This one. Zero. Nobody thought there was one, did they? Okay, good job. All right, here we have one, and here we have three and here we have three remember that in order to be considered the same kind your environment has to be totally the same okay so can you find me one kind those at the end which end are they all the same all four of those metals okay Okay, these two are one kind, and these two are another kind. They're not the same, because this one is three carbons away from a carbonyl, and this one's by an O. In order to be identical, you have to be exact. Okay, so that's one, two. Okay, what else we got? The two connected to this one, three. Okay, what about those two little bitty H's all by their lonesomes? That's two more, four and five. Okay. You see why the two methyls are the same on each of those two carbons. You can rotate around, they're gonna be the same, okay? It's just kind of like naming kind of works to help you figure that out too. Okay. Shielding. Okay, so the concept of shielding in NMR is you have an external magnetic field that is affecting the motion of electrons within the molecules. We talked about how the protons are flipping. Okay. But there's other things in the molecule besides the protons, and those are the electrons. The electrons are also going to be affected by the magnetic field, 
and they are going to move and they are going to induce their own magnetic field that's going to affect the protons. Okay, we're not going to specifically look at that electron's magnetic field, but they're going to affect our protons. The direction of the induced magnetic field is opposite to that of the applied magnetic field. So you have to overcome it. It is going to be like shielding is like putting a shield between the protons and the magnetic field. In order for this proton to get enough energy to flip, it has to overcome that shield that's in the way of those electrons. Okay, there are things that are going to affect where those elect that shield is in the molecule. Maybe. There we go. Okay. Um, the effective field that the nuclei actually sense through the surrounding electronic environment is somewhat smaller than the applied field. Protons in electron dense environments sense a smaller effective magnetic field and require a lower frequency to flip because the delta E is smaller. Okay, and we're going to talk about electron dense environments. Okay, just hang on. Okay, sometimes this is referred to as diamagnetic shielding. I don't know if you need to know that word or not, really. Okay, so here is a uh, basic NMR. Okay, you're going to get a spectrum and you're going to have peaks on that spectrum. Okay, there's going to be a range. This over here is going to be zero, and this is going to be, uh, I'm gonna say 12. That's about where they, they go in proton NMR. The, the scales change when you change nuclei. Okay, if you are in an electron-rich environment, that means that you have a lot of electron density around you, you will be more shielded, and you will be what we call upfield. Okay, so this way is upfield, this, this way is downfield. This way is more shielded, this way is less shielded. Okay, this way takes more energy to flip, this way takes less energy to flip. Now what's gonna change how much electron density is around a hydrogen? Well, what about electronegative elements. So if you put a chlorine on a molecule that didn't have a chlorine on it, what is the chlorine gonna do? It's gonna pull electron density towards it because it is more electronegative, okay? So that means that those protons next to a chlorine will be more de-shielded and thus come down field, okay? And I think we got pictures for that. Okay, oh, I gotta tell you this. The chemical shift is a measure of the degree to which the nucleus in the molecule is shielded, okay? Protons in different chemical environments are shielded to different degrees. This is measured relative to tetramethylsilane, TMS. This is your standard, okay? There are some other standards that can be used, but this is like the more widely used like to the 20th degree, okay? Like everybody uses TMS. So that's all we're gonna use is TMS, okay? You use those other things for special cases, okay? TMS is tetramethylsilane, okay? It's what's gonna come at zero, and then everything else is gonna be shifted relative to this. Do you notice how many kinds of hydrogens are in TMS? How many kinds of hydrogen? One. So you will have a nice little peak for TMS that you will set at zero, okay? And there's a way to do that when you actually run the instrument. This will be your peak that's farthest to the right. Is it possible for something to come farther to the right than TMS? Yes, but those are special cases we're not gonna go 
for all of your intents and purposes, the peak that's farthest to the right is always going to be TM. Okay? And we will set that at zero. Everything else is going to be shifted from that. Okay, so what can affect where it shifts? Well, I already mentioned electronegative amps. Okay, both how close they are to those protons and how many there are. So if you have two chlorines, do you think on the same carbon, do you think that those hydrogens will be shifted more than one chlorine or thought or less than one? So if you're looking at this versus, we're not worrying about the actual numbers yet, this, which hydrogens will come farther downfield? The ones with one chlorine or the ones with two chlorines? Two, because two of them are pulling electron density away from those protons. So they have to flip downfield, more energy, okay? You can also have magnetic fields from other sources within the molecule, okay? An example of that, quite simply, is a double bond. A double bond is gonna make its own magnetic field that's gonna affect it, we'll get to that, okay? Uh, double bonds, benzene rings, Here's a benzene ring. Benzene rings, every cart, we haven't done them yet. We're getting there. I think that's the very next step. Okay, benzene rings, those carbons are all what hybridization? Here are the hybridization of all the carbons in that benzene ring. SP2, right? Okay, they all have how many hydrogens on them? One. Okay, what is the geometry of an sp2 hybridized carbon? Trigonal planar. Benzene rings are flat. Okay, that makes a big, that's real important. Okay, benzene rings are flat. Okay, so we'll talk about, we'll get to those. Okay, we're going to start with electronegative atoms. Okay. Here is a simple NMR of only TMS, okay? Very basic, okay? This is zero. This is your peak at zero. That's your TMS peak, okay? So the typical scale is zero to 10, but there is some protons. There are some protons that will come above 10, okay? But that's your basic scale, okay? When you are closer to TMS, you are shielded upfield. When you are farther from TMS, you are downfield, de-shielded. Okay? Shielded, upfield, de-shield, downfield. Okay? It's like for some reason getting the look, they both start with D. Does that help? For some reason getting those terms right, people get it mixed up. Okay. Electronegative substituents decrease the shielding of methyl groups. So here is simple compounds. Every one of these compounds has how many kinds of hydrogen in it? Hmm? How many? One, right? We got one. These are the same. One. These are all the same. These are the same. And here's your TMS. Notice what is changing. What's changing is the extra element. Here we don't have one. Notice that it comes at 0.9. Here we have three methyls on a nitrogen. They come at 2.2. Here we have two methyls on oxygen. They come at 3.2. And here we have a fluorine, your most electronegative element on the periodic table. And it, these are coming at 4.3. So what has changed in each one of them? We have added an electronegative element, and the electronegative element is getting more electronegative. So what does that do to our ship? Well, the fluorine is pulling electron density towards it. So these hydrogens are seeing more of the magnetic field, okay? They're not as shielded from it as the ethane is, okay? So they take more energy to 
it's it's minor differences okay but those minor differences can be interpreted by your computer back in the day we didn't even have it i remember when we got one with a computer it was like whoo is the the first nmr that i ever used y'all it looked like the cockpit of an airplane i mean you had to like sit in it kind of and there were all these dials and knobs and everything and you had to go and change them all okay and get them all set right so you could see your specter and you had one of these magic markers that was doing this drawing your peaks and if you didn't get the paper lined up right and get tms on zero on your paper you'd be all messed up okay so uh they have come a long way and that probably was a cool one at the time okay so yeah they've come a long way when we got one with the computer we were all like jumping up and down you have no idea and in order to learn how to use it it took like a month you had to have somebody go with you every time you had to get a spectra and then you had to get checked out But he wrote you a really cool uh, deal when you got checked out that you were cleared to use the NMR. It was cute. But man, everybody was scared of it. Scared to death of it. Okay, so look at that compound. That compound has two types of protons. Do you agree? What are the two types? Right. These are one and this is one. Okay. This is where they come. 0.9 and 1.3. So notice that even within the molecule that didn't have any electronegative element, there still is a little effect from just plain old carbon. Okay, so this guy is a little farther down. Now those are pretty close together, but you know, if you work your NMI right, you, you can see both of them. All right, what about this one? Do you see the three types of protons? Does everybody agree that this CH2 and this CH2 are not the same? Okay, so those are your three kinds. What is this? What is NO2? It's a nitro group. Okay, anybody know what the Lewis structure of a nitro group? Did you ever draw NO2 minus in general chem? Maybe if you were lucky or unlucky okay here's what a nitro group looks like i'm going to do an r i'm just going to draw it for you we're not going to belabor it look at what you got in there you got a plus on the n and a minus on the o notice the overall charge is still zero okay all right so which one of these protons do you think will be the farthest downfield which one all right, here, I'll label them A, B, C. So who's farthest down, Phil? A. Which one you think will be the next farthest? B. And who's going to be the most upfield? C. The effect drops off as expected. Okay. Okay, and here's the numbers 4.3, 2.0, and 1.0. Notice that this is almost the same as this. So like two carbons away, when you get to the third carbon, it's pretty much the effect is gone. Okay? Make as a sun? So far, so good? Okay, those are your shifts. Okay, notice how the effect quickly falls off as the protons become farther removed from the electronegative atom or atoms. Okay? And that holds for any of them. All right. Now, here are four compounds. I want you to put them in order of increasing shielding. Okay. Increasing shielding of the protons in an animal. You have to think about what that means too, okay? Keep that in 
mind when you're studying questions for for the task that you need to think about what the terms mean. Okay, don't just jump. Just take your time. Okay, it was 15, wasn't it? Okay. All right. What are the extremes? We'll start with that. What are the extremes? CH4 and the chloroform, CHCl3. That's chloroform, by the way. Okay, so those are your extremes. Okay. Why didn't I have CCl4 in there? Any idea? Okay, remember that this is proton NMR. That's why CCl4 went in there. Okay, so which one has more shielding, CH4 or CHCl3? CH4, because what are the three chlorines doing? They're pulling the electron density towards them, so they are going to be less shielded by the electron density. Okay, so which one is it gonna be? Because we're going in order of increasing. So that's gonna be least to most. Okay, so is this, does everybody agree with three, two, one, zero? For chlorine. Okay, I didn't figure that would be brown. So you could have gone through here and started cutting out the ones that didn't make sense and get it narrowed down to A or C. Right? Okay. Trying to give you a little tactic there. Okay, the effect is totally cumulative. Notice that when you have one chlorine on there, the shift is 3.1. Look at two. 5.3, look at three, 7.3. Remember our scale only went to like 10. Okay, more halogens, larger shift. And of course, these are the only protons that we're looking at. They're the only ones in the mouth. Okay. Okay, which proton in the molecule below do you think will be the furthest downfield in the proton NMR? What do you think? Not asking you what the number is. I'm just asking you which one would be the farthest downfill. See how you're thinking. And you know that there's five kinds, right? Can't you get it that? Okay, we're all there. You ready? Let's see what you did. Okay, furthest downfield is to the left or the right? Left. Furthest downfield is this way. Okay, who's going to be shifted the farthest? What do you think? How did you decide? What do you look for? Things that shift it. What shifts it? Electronegative element. We got that one. What else we got? We got one of these. Okay. It's D. 
because D has how many things affecting its shift? Two, okay? We, I'm not worried about the number yet, okay? We're just figuring out which is which. A lot of times you can figure out a structure without knowing much of the numbers, okay? Just looking at where they are, where they are, who's farther down those. Okay, diamagnetic anisotropy. That's a fancy term for different magnetic fields within the molecule, okay? Pi electrons are free to move in response to a magnetic field, whereas sigma electrons are not so free to move. Okay, they're there, but they don't, they don't get to move like the, um, the pi ones do, okay? They circulate and induce a local magnetic field. That magnetic field is gonna affect where the protons split. So you see how all these things are affecting where the protons split. That's the basic thing to know. Okay, how this affects the proton depends on where they are in relation to this magnetic field. So I'm gonna show you some pictures. You got pictures, right? That, that you, okay. So here's a double bond. Do you have this picture? Yes. All right, all right, cool. Yeah, you got my pictures, okay. Applied magnetic field. This is the direction of the applied magnetic field. And looking at this, these red um, lines, the little curved lines around the double bond are where the induced magnetic field is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field in the region where the proton is located. So those protons come from four to six, okay? They are shifted down field. Same thing with this proton. Do you see that here we have a double bond, but it's not between two carbons. It's between a carbon and an oxygen. Now there isn't a um, proton on that oxygen, so we're not gonna worry about it, because there isn't one. But do you see this hydrogen? That hydrogen comes really far downfield. It comes around 10. Okay, and this is, what kind of functional group is that? What? Aldehyde. Okay, so this is indicative of aldehyde, that you get that proton way downfield. If you had a ketone, you wouldn't have an H attached there. There won't be a peak down there, okay? All right, here's your aromatic ring, okay? Now you have your carbons that are flat and you have your P electrons, okay? Remember each one of those carbons is SP2 hybridized, so it has a P orbital, okay? They make what looks like donuts above and below the um, carbon framework. Okay, and so you're gonna have this magnetic field going all the way around that benzene ring, okay? That makes the hydrogens attached to this benzene ring come six and a half to eight and a half. They're pretty far down field. That's very indicative of a benzene ring. The number to remember is seven. I'll tell you some numbers to remember, okay? The induced magnetic field is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field. So if you're adding to the magnetic field, it's going to take more energy to flip your proton. Okay? That's why it's downfield. It's taking more energy. Okay? Protons attached to sp2 hybridized carbons are less shielded than those attached to sp3 hybridized carbons. All right, so here is our benzene ring, and look at this. Okay, this little thing, have you seen this before? What, what Greek letter is that? Where did we use it? We talked about charges, like partial negative and partial positive. Okay, it also stands for the shift from TMS. Okay, and so the, these come around 7.3. Here's your regular double bond. Those are at 5.3, and then without anything, it's 0.9. Okay, 
okay? Those are more shielded, these are less shielded, these take more energy, they are downfield on the spectrum, okay? Are you still with me? All right, just hang in there. Once you get used to it, it's, it's not so bad. Okay, triple bonds are a little bit weird because of the geometry, okay? You've got a linear, and you're, look at where your proton is. It's right here. The um, double bonds, the protons were sticking out like this, okay? So the different direction of the proton in this field changes where it comes. So you might think, well, it was gonna come higher, but it isn't. It comes at a lower number because the magnetic field is opposite to that of the applied magnetic field, okay? The other ones are adding to it. This one is subtracting. But you'll see it's still two to three. It's not like it's 0.5 or something. It's two to three. All right, so here is the double bonds. We're 5.3. Here is this one, 2.4. Okay, and that's for that actual molecule. How many kinds of protons are in the molecule on the right? Let's see how we're doing. Three. There's one, two, three. Of those three, which one do you think will be the farthest downfield? Two. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, protons attached to benzylic and allylic carbons are less shielded than usual. So this is allylic next to a double bond. Benzylic is this one. This is next to a benzene ring. Okay, there are hydrogens on this benzene ring, right? There's five of them. Okay, those are farther downfield. This one comes around 2.6. And notice again, the effect starts to drop off. Okay, it's still shifted a little more from that one that's around one, but not near as much as the other ones. Okay, this one is like a normal methyl. It's at 0.8. This guy is 1.5. He's downfield a little bit. Okay, he's not as far downfield as this guy because he is one carbon away from the double bond. Okay. Okay, protons attached to, oh, this is the aldehyde thing, are very deshielded. So this guy is about 9.7, so it's around 10. Okay, notice that this guy is next to the carbonyl. He's at 2.4, and then these are at 1.1. Again, the effect drops off quickly. Okay, generally speaking, you're gonna be able to tell things that are directly attached and one away. Then it kind of drops off, okay? Maybe we'll go to the next one. Okay, here is what a typical NMR used to look like when you had to use the marker and you had to, you had to get paper that was graph paper-like, okay? And you had to get a special paper that was made for your instrument. Now what's gonna happen is you're gonna print it on just a plain old piece of white paper off of the computer, okay? It's gonna look like this, except you won't have the grid behind it. Okay, and when you get your spectra, you will be able to get exactly what the numbers are, okay? Because like, I'm gonna ask you, what is this number for that compound? Well, here's seven, here's eight, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 in between. So what do you think that is? you have to guesstimate in between the lines, okay? So it's gonna be 7.3, what do you think? I'd go with six. <coughs> How about that? If you're worried about it, just go with 7.3, okay? But 7.36, that's what we used to have to do. But now the instrument is gonna give you exactly what all the numbers are. 
okay, every one of them, okay? This is TMS, which should be set at zero. It's a little off, okay? When I look at that, I want, oh. Put it in the book, and it's off a little bit. It makes you mad when you see what they put in books sometimes. All right, so look at what this is. This is an important NMR to see because we use, I can't write over here. All right, I guess I'm writing on this. This for our solvent. What is the D? Do you remember what the D is? Deuterium. And what's different about it and a proton? It has one proton and one neutron. It is two. Remember that NMRs detect odd mass numbers. So we use what we refer to as deuterochloroform for our solvents. Okay, do we buy 100% deuterochloroform? No, because it's who's expensive. But we can get 99.8% D at a pretty good price. Okay, we also buy it spiked with TMS. So we let somebody else put the TMS in there and get the proportions right instead of having to do it ourselves, okay? Um, TMS is a very volatile compound. If you left it out on the bench, it would evaporate pretty quickly, okay? So you're gonna have to make sure you put your caps on your bottles, caps on your tubes pretty much right away. Okay, now it's 99.8% D. What is the other 0.2%? What do you think it is? If it's not D, it's, it's H, okay? It's gonna be this, okay? And what will happen is you're gonna see it in your NMR. So you need to remember that 7.3, 7.4, a little peak right there is from your chloroform. It is not from your, okay? So you'll have to remember that when you get your spectrum. You're gonna know everything. So by the time you go there, he's just gonna ask you questions. You're just gonna whip them out, the answer then. Get your spectra. Getting the spectra is the harder part. Okay, here are some chemical shift values, okay? Now, don't go too crazy with this. I don't want you to be like hyper, like, oh my gosh, a CH3 is 0.85, a CH2 is 1.2, and try to memorize all the numbers because it will drive you crazy, okay? Because as soon as the environment in the, pro in the molecule changes, the shift values change too. So what you wanna know is like region. Stuff around one is your regular saturated type on regular carbon, okay? That's the stuff around one. That's how I learn it, okay? If um, you are next to a carbonyl like this, notice it's 2.1. So it's like a little above two. So carbonyls get you down to two, okay? If you're next to a benzene ring, it gets you down around two. Are you gonna have trouble shawling those apart? No, you won't. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna be given a formula with your spectrum, okay? You'll be able to figure out that's a benzene ring, okay? If you're next to your triple bond, your 2.4, same deal, okay? It's a little above two. If you are by an oxygen, okay, you're above three. So start at the right side of your spectrum. You're going from basically zero to 10. At one is your regular hydrogens, the ones that are on regular carbons, okay? When you get around two, you start getting something will affect the shift. A benzene ring, carbonyl, okay? When you get to three, you hit the oxygen, okay? So try to work it that way instead of memorizing all those numbers. Okay, five is double bonds, regular double bonds, not bending rings. Okay, 
Ah, uh, you're gonna love these. NH2 and ROH, look at that. We only have 10, so two to five, that's almost half the spectra, okay? So you don't worry about that one until you get everybody else figured, okay? And there's some tricks you can do to help you figure that out. We'll get it to them, okay? Here's your OH off a bending ring. AR is shorthand for a bending ring, okay? Okay, benzene, seven, seven. Okay, aldehyde, around 10. It says nine to 10, usually it's really close to 10. Now, this one is pretty nifty. Carboxylic acids. This is the one that comes above 10. Okay, it's affected by oxygen and the carbonyl, and that pulls it way down. Okay, and here would be if you had an amide, a primary amide. I don't know if JV will give you one of those, but those NH2s are, those hydrogens are five to eight. Okay kind of get you in the realm of thinking about the ships. Okay, now here we go. Which type of protons in the structure below will be the furthest down field? So who's gonna be the furthest down field? I'm not asking you what the number is. I just wanna know what the furthest down field. We're trying to take baby steps to get you through all the things and then put it all together. Okay. There's no hydrogens on there. Remember, draw them in. Draw them in. If the stick structures confuse you, draw them in. Draw in the hydrogen. It will make your life better. Okay, what about this one? Who's father's down filled on this one, you think? We did that compound earlier on how many kinds of... Down. You up there? Nobody picked B. Okay, why is it C and not E? All right, this hydrogen here is affected by the carbonyl and the bromine. Both. Okay. All right, what about this one? Only four choices. Should I put E up by the hydrogen? You know there's. Breaking stuff up here? You dropped your what? Your ring up. Oh. Righty. All right. Make it make a choice. All right, how are we doing? Yes, it's D. Don't forget those aldehydes want to come around 10. Okay. C would be next, then B, then A. A will be the furthest upfield, closest to TMS. 
Okay, this is a 1-bromo 2,2-dimethyl propane. Okay, I want you to notice how many kinds of hydrogens are in that structure. We've got the CH2, and then we have the three CH3s. Okay, which one do you think will be the farthest down field? The CH2 or the CH3s? The CH2, because it's next to the bromine. Here's where it is. This is the CH2. This is the CH3s. Okay, and what is this little peak over here? It, it's labeled for you. TMS, TMS. Don't take TMS and try to make that part of your structure. It's left off. Okay, now you see where they're coming on the, on the scale. Notice the methyls are a couple of carbons away from the bromine, so they're barely affected. Okay, they're just a little bit above one. Okay, this guy is 3.2. 3 point, yeah, 3.2 something. Okay, something, something. Do you notice anything else about the peaks? Yeah, one of them is way taller than the other, okay? This green line here, oh, it's not letting me, this green line here, you'll see, goes across, goes up, and then goes up higher, okay? That green line is referred to as an integration line. What an integral is, if you took calculus, is the area under the peak. Okay, and thankfully the instrument does that for us. We don't have to try to figure out the area under that peak. The area under the peak is directly related to the number of hydrogens that make up that peak. So this is two hydrogens, and this one is nine hydrogens. So the peak on the right is over four times bigger than the peak on the left. Okay, so you can tell the number of hydrogens that make up each peak by looking at the integration value. So what you would do is you would measure from here to here. And you would measure from here to here. And you would actually look at the numbers, okay? Just make sure you use the same units. Don't do one in centimeters and one in millimeters. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter what unit you use. Back in the day, we had a whole bunch of little squares and we would count squares. It's easier to use. We learned that the hard way after going batty counting the squares. Okay, how many kinds of hydrogens are in this molecule? How many? Okay, they are the CH3, the CH2, and all of these CH3s. Okay, which peak do you think should be the farthest downfield? The CH2. Very good. All right, so let's look at it. So here it is, okay? So you have this peak here at 3.246, 3.7 maybe, okay? And then you have this peak here at two point, what do you think this one is? Okay, this one is a CH2. Who do you think will be next for this downfield? The methyl or the T-butyl? The methyl, because it's closer to the Carbonyl. What else is a clue? The height of the peaks, right? Because you see over here, this one is way taller. So this is the T-butyl group. T-butyl groups are usually really easy to spot. They're around one. Notice it is shifted a little. Okay? It's those protons are two carbons away from the oxygen, and they're at 1.1234 almost 1.5, okay? Now, I think that this goes away. There you go, there they are, okay? How are you feeling about it? Okay, just hang in there, okay? And we'll do some unknowns in class and stuff too, so. And I'll give you even an extra worksheet because I'm like that. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I 